Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, we're picking up with the third of the seven churches that Jesus sent these letters to. And this is to the messenger of the church in Pergamos. Write, these things, says he who has the sharp, the two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now, as you hopefully remember, these letters were, of course, written originally to these churches in these particular locations in the Roman province of Asia. The Roman province of Asia is modern Turkey, at least uh, part of modern Turkey. And so these messages, as we pointed out, have or had an immediate application to the churches that received them. But they also have a, an application, as we've been emphasizing, beyond that local church, because these are the various conditions that the church might find itself in all throughout the age of the church. And so it has the local immediate application. It has the broader application to uh, all churches for all time. But then, as we've also reminded you, it, of course, would then have a personal application, even for us tonight, perhaps, because churches are made up of individuals. And these conditions are conditions that you might find in the lives of individual people. So as we've been doing, we want to look at the historical situation. We want to look at the broader situation for the church. But then ultimately, we want to bring it down and look at the personal application of it. So again, remember that these were uh, written to the overseers of the churches, to the pastor of the church. And the pastor was the one that Jesus was holding accountable to make sure that things were right in the church. And so to this church in the city of Pergamos. Now, Pergamos was the capital of an ancient empire. King Attalus had a great empire there uh, centuries before the Romans ever came to power. But when the Romans came to power, they actually, um, the descendants of Attalus actually uh, bequeathed the empire to Rome. So Rome took over and Pergamos became the uh, Roman capital of Asia. And so this was the seat of governmental power uh, during the time that this letter would have been written from John to the church there. The, the, uh, the, the center of governmental authority for that province was based there. Now, Jesus, he, as, as he's doing in each one of these letters, he's referring back to the vision that John had, and he's taking different aspects of that vision, and he's uh, addressing them and referring to himself in uh, a particular way as it relates to the situation there in that church. Now, he addresses them here as the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. So, of course, the, the sword was symbolic of authority. The sword was symbolic of judgment. 
The two-edged sword, of course, was symbolic of the word of God. And so Jesus is speaking to them as the one who has absolute authority. He's speaking to them as the one who is the word of God. And he says to them, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Now, of course, the ancient world was a pagan world. It was a world that was filled, for the most part, with idolatry. But there were places where the idolatry was uh, um, over the top. And Pergamos was one of those places. Pergamos was filled with temples to various gods and goddesses. Not only was it the governmental center, but it was also the center for that province of Caesar worship. You see, the Caesars were worshipped as gods. And that was part of the, the rift and, and the conflict that developed within the, that period for the church. Because the church, of course, knew that Jesus was Lord. And so... Christians were not able to submit to the idea that Caesar was Lord. Now, the the emperor worship was tolerant to a certain extent. They would allow you to worship any God you wanted as long as you would also give obeisance to Caesar. But that was mandatory. So you could... You, you could worship any God you want, but you had to also acknowledge that Caesar was Lord. Now, of course, the Christians couldn't do that. So this brought them into conflict with the Caesar worship. But it wasn't only the worship of Caesar that was based there for that Roman province. Uh, there was also a great temple to Zeus in that city. There was a temple to the goddess Aphrodite. And there was also a great temple to the god uh, Asclepius, and this was the god of healing. And people would come from all over the world to go into this temple, and there they would hope to receive healing from this particular god. But the symbol of this god was, interestingly, the serpent. And so this was a place where, in a sense, all of the satanic... Uh, Power had just sort of settled in this particular area. And that's why Jesus refers to it as the place of Satan's throne. So this is where they were dwelling, where Satan's throne was erected. And we see that there was conflict for the church. But he commends them because they held fast to his name and did not deny the faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr. Now, Antipas is probably not the actual name of the person who was martyred, but probably a name that was given to him because the name Antipas literally means against all. And so this is a person who probably stood firm in the faith, but in doing so, he stood against what they perceived to be everything. He was against the Caesar worship. He was against the worship of Zeus. He was against the worship of Aphrodite. He was against, so he was considered to be against everything. You know, sometimes we have that accusation being hurled at us today as followers of Jesus. Well, you people are just against everything. Well, when you're living where Satan's throne is, that's kind of just the way it works. It's hard to be for much when you see most of what's going on around you is evil. But there was this person and he became known as Antipas, but he suffered for his faith, but he was faithful to the point of death. He was martyred. But again, Jesus emphasizes it's where Satan's throne dwelt. But now he goes on and he says to them, having committed them, he says, but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, what happened evidently 
was even though the leadership in the church had not embraced this false teaching that was coming in, they were tolerating it. They were allowing it to happen. They were giving room in the assembly for these people who had embraced what Jesus referred to here as this doctrine of Balaam. So they were trying to be gracious and tolerant, but this is the very thing that the Lord rebuked them for because they allowed in their midst those who held to the doctrine of Balaam. Now, Balaam was a, he was an interesting person. He was a prophet of sorts, but he turned out in the end to be, in a sense, um, a false prophet probably wouldn't be exactly the the way to refer to him, but he was uh, maybe better uh, an apostate prophet. He was a prophet who turned away from the Lord for financial gain rather than remaining faithful to the Lord. You can read his prophecies in Numbers chapters 22 through 24, and he actually has some amazing prophecies, even prophecies that have to do with the Messiah. He prophesied of Jesus. He was the one who prophesied that a star would come out of Jacob. And that's a, a prophecy concerning the Messiah there. But in the end, what happened with Balaam is that he gave in to his own lust. And even though he, he was hired by Balaam to curse Israel, which he couldn't do, in the end, what he did is he devised a scheme by which Balaam could uh, seduce the Israelites and get God to curse them himself. So he gave Balaam this counsel and this led, notice Jesus tells us what it led to. It led to Balak putting a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality And then he goes on and he says, you also have there those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So what had happened is they had allowed into the church and given them a place within the fellowships there in Pergamos. They had allowed these people that were basically teaching Christians to embrace idolatry. They were incorporating idolatrous practices into the worship of Jesus Christ. So this is where idolatry began to creep into the church. Now, interestingly, the word Pergamos, I'll I'll give you two words that you'll make the connection. Monogamy, I'll give you three words, monogamy, polygamy, and bigamy. The, the, the second part of each of those words is the Greek word gamas. That word is the Greek word for marriage. And the very word pergamus itself, it speaks of a marriage, but it speaks of a marriage that was wrong. And what's happening here is indicated in the very name of this place. The church, which is the bride of Christ, is in a, uh, a relationship with the world. The church is merging with the world. The church is embracing the world. The church is buying into the idolatrous system and incorporating idolatrous practices into It's worship. That's the thing that Jesus was dealing with, with this church in Pergamos. That's what was occurring here. And of course, the one word that he had for them was the word repent. But he says they had also embraced the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We talked about the Nicolaitans a few weeks back because uh, they were mentioned in the letter to the church of Ephesus where Jesus commended them for hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans, he commended them for that. Because what was happening here was there was a priestly class that was beginning to develop in the church. 
there was this separation between what you would call eventually a clergy and a laity. There was a dominance. There was a ruling over the people. And there was a taking away of the responsibility and the accountability of the people. And it was putting it in the hands of a priestly class. And these were no doubt the ones who were also uh, embracing the idolatrous activity. Now, notice there's two things that he mentions here. Eating things that were sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. Almost all across the board, all of the ancient idolatrous forms of worship had a sexually immoral element to them. In most cases, there were temples with priestesses, priests. Part of the whole routine was... uh, various acts of sexual immorality. Part of their worship of these false gods was to give their bodies over to the priest or to the priestess in some sort of act of worship. So idolatry and sexual immorality have historically gone hand in hand. Now, the next church that we come to, the church of Thyatira, the same issues are there, but the order is reversed. And so... What it seems to me is that Pergamos, the primary problem was idolatry. The secondary problem was sexual immorality. When we come to Thyatira, the situation is reversed. And we'll wait to talk about the sexual immorality till we get to the church of Thyatira. We want to concentrate tonight on the topic of idolatry. But now, having looked at the historical situation... Let's take it out beyond that. And what have we seen? And what do we see in some cases to this very day? Uh, We see that there has been, throughout the long history of the church, there has always been this effort by the enemy to get into the church and to introduce false teaching, to introduce idolatrous practices and activities And what Satan does is he tries to work from the inside out. Now, in some places, he's not able to get in. So he's forced to work from the outside. And his tactic then is a different tactic. There was no room for the devil in the church of Smyrna. So what did he do? We saw what he did. He persecuted them. He cast them into prison. Here... He finds an inroad. He finds an entrance into the church. Because the leadership, who should have been guarding, who should have been watching out, they became lax. They bought into the whole idea that, you know, we need to be a little more tolerant. We shouldn't be so rigid. We need to be a little more flexible. And, you know, these people, they have a different idea, but we can accommodate them. And in that accommodation... They basically let the devil in. And that has happened over and over and over again historically in the church. And the church has been, sadly, it has been filled with much idolatry over the centuries. We look back at Israel and we see the miserable failure of the nation of Israel. Their great failure was they constantly went off into idolatrous practices. They worshipped the gods of the Canaanites. They worshipped the gods of the Babylonians. And the judgment of God came upon them for that. The church has, in effect, done the same thing that Israel did. And in many ways, the history of the church is no better off than the history of the nation of Israel. Israel failed miserably. In, in, in particularly in this area of idolatry, and the church has failed miserably uh, in this area of idolatry. And this happened early on, and, and we see it was beginning to happen in this church and perhaps in other churches at the time, but as the history of the church went on, more and more idolatry came in. In the early 4th century, The church, after having a long, long season of persecution, which kept it fairly pure, the church suddenly came into favor with the world. The Roman emperor Constantine, he realized 
that there were so many Christians in his empire that it would probably be advantageous to his reign to lift the persecution off of them and to get them on his side. And so that's basically what he did. He claims to have had a conversion experience. Uh, historians are divided on to whether, uh, as to whether his, his conversion was legitimate. I've read both sides of the story. To me, it doesn't sound like a real conversion at all. But what happened is this man, who was the Roman emperor at the time, he, in effect, suddenly became the head of the church. And what he did is he just sort of made a proclamation that his empire was now a Christian empire rather than a pagan empire. But there was no preaching of the gospel. There was no necessity of individual people putting their faith and trust in Christ. It was just a, a blanket, you know, proclamation from the emperor that you're all now Christians. But, of course, the fact of the matter was nobody was Christians. They were all still very much pagans, but now they just had a new uh, title. They were now Christians. And all of the paganism that they were involved in was suddenly Christianized. If you get the Encyclopedia Britannica, and if you go to the article on Christianity in the Encyclopedia Britannica, that article will tell you that Christianity is a combination of faith that was rooted in Judaism and various forms of paganism. And from a certain point of view, that's what Christianity has become. But of course, it was not originally that. It was never intended to be that. But sadly, that is exactly what happened. Now, something that might be a bit interesting to you, the title that Constantine held was uh, Pontifex Maximus. There is a man today who holds that title. We know him as the Pope. And that particular system goes all the way back to that union that began. Many people are under the, the false idea that Jesus was the founder of the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, most Catholics are under that delusion. And they will tell you that Catholic Church is the oldest church. It goes back to Jesus. It does not go back to Jesus. It goes back to the fourth century it goes back to Constantine. It goes back to the state taking over the church and the secular emperor becoming the head of the church and bringing idolatrous practices into the church. And it's manifested itself in one way or another ever since that time. Catholicism is just one manifestation of it. But you can find it in all different kinds of manifestations. You see it in the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church is separate from the Roman Catholic Church. They had the Great Schism in 1054. They broke, but yet the, uh, the Orthodox Church has always been in um, league with the government, with the state, with the, with the secular power. It's, ha it's happened all throughout history. And it, it's happening, of course, still today. Back during the Soviet era, most people will tell you today that the majority of uh, the leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church were also KGB officers, connected with that corrupt atheistic government. And we, we can find it you know, in all different kinds of relationships between church and state. You can find it, of course, in Anglicanism, where you had uh, Henry VIII, you know, uh, throwing the Pope out of England, and basically he himself became the head of the church. And the Anglican church, that's how it came into being, Henry VIII being the first head over the Anglican church. And if you know anything about British history, Henry VIII was anything but a Christian, or a godly man. So we've got this kind of stuff that, that has gone on all throughout history. And it is, is going on today as well. It's not only manifested in these links between church and state and this kind of thing. But it's also manifested in a different way. 
when leaders within the church embrace idolatrous ideologies and incorporate them into the, try to incorporate them into the faith. You know, all of these ancient gods that everybody worshipped, all of these gods were basically representative of, of certain ideologies. And some of them were representative of, of obviously gross kinds of things, sensuality and so forth. Some of them were a bit more sophisticated. The Babylonian god Nebo was the god of education. He was the god of wisdom. He was the god of literature. He was the god of the academic world. But he was equally uh, an idol. And we have had that same thing, and we have that presently going on in the church, where people in the church, uh, in, in positions of leadership, they have allowed, they have tolerated, they have welcomed in idolatrous ideologies that have undermined the, the person of Jesus, the place of Jesus, the authority of Jesus, the authority of God's word. You know, it's absolutely amazing what has happened. If you think of denominations, like, for example, the Presbyterian denomination or the Methodist denomination. Presbyterianism began essentially with John Knox in Scotland. And John Knox was a, a very devout follower of Christ. And he was a reformer. He was the one who cried out, give me Scotland or give me death. He was, uh, amongst others, one of the founding fathers of Presbyterianism. And for many years, Presbyterianism was a, a biblically sound, although very reformed, uh, perspective on Christianity. But there came a time when the leadership in that particular denomination began to open its doors uh, in tolerance to all different kinds of ideologies. And what ended up happening is that the evil element overwhelmed the good element and all of the the righteous men in the denomination ended up having to flee and start other denominations. The same thing happened with Methodism. Methodism began with the, the Wesley brothers, Charles Wesley, John Wesley, George Whitfield, great pillars of the evangelical faith. But what happened in a process of time, those denominations were taken over by liberals. Now, liberals are simply uh, idolaters. There are those who have idolized human intellect over God's word as the authority. That's what liberalism is. It's basically just putting humanistic philosophies and ideologies above the word of God. And that's exactly what they did. And it's happened so many times over. You think of, like, for example, Harvard University, which was started by John Harvard with the intention of training men as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can hardly find a more liberal institution on the planet than Harvard today. But it all began by opening the door and by tolerating, by allowing these idolatrous ideologies to come in. Now, we're not finished with that because it's happening still and it's happening once again and it's happening in a big way right now. Many of you have heard recently, as Pastor Chuck has shared on the subject of the emergent church. I'm not going to go into the details of that tonight, but that is just another example of what we're talking about. It is basically a, a, what, what you would call a neoliberalism. Neo meaning new. It's a new liberalism. It's the same old rubbish. It's the same old idolatrous teaching. It's the same old uh, rejection of the truth, it's just now coming in a new package, a package that looks a little more appealing. It's a little hipper. It's a little cooler for the 21st century. But it's basically teaching the same thing. It's teaching idolatry, sexual immorality. It's merging the world with the church. It's saying we want the world to accept us. We want the world to like us. We don't want to stand against the tide of the culture. It's basically a politically correct version of Christianity. But here's the astounding thing about it. It's gaining popularity. And some of the guys who are in positions of leadership within this movement, they are the most frequently interviewed. 
all of the major Christian publishers are publishing their books without considering the fact that they're publishing heretical IDs, ideologies. It's, it's astounding what's going on. But the point is simply this. This strategy of the devil works. And so he keeps doing it over and over again. He comes in and tries to make a place for himself in the church. I mentioned Harvard. There are many other um, seminaries, institutions that began as uh, Bible-based institutions that have become bastions of, of liberalism, where the original founders of these institutions, they wanted to, a place to educate men so they would know the Bible, so they would know Christ, so they could go out and preach the gospel and change the world. And those institutions today, you go there and they teach you, you can't trust the Bible. The Bible isn't really the word of God. Jesus isn't the only savior. He didn't really die on the cross for our sins. This is what they teach you in seminaries today. So it's insane. But it is what we're talking about here. It's the church of Pergamos. It's the same thing, just again, repeated over and over historically. That's the point of these letters. This is what you're going to find throughout the history of the church. Not everybody's involved in this particular thing, but you will find these pockets. And that's what we've seen. But then again, remember, there's also the personal aspect here. And what's the issue that we're dealing with? It's the issue of idolatry. And what is idolatry? Idolatry is simply worshiping or serving something or someone other than the Lord Jesus Christ. It can be as primitive as some sort of a carved image. It can be as sophisticated as a brilliant human ideology. And everything in between can possibly be an idol. It's whatever your heart is engaged with. It's whatever your, your passion is directed toward. That, in essence, becomes your God. That's the whole point. The whole point is an idol takes the place of God in a person's life, takes the place of the true God. So what it really comes down to is anything that's taken the place of God in your life, you included... If you've decided you're going to be your own God, you're going to call the shots. You're going to do what you want to do. You're going to live your own way. You have erected yourself as an idol. And this, of course, is what happens to people on that individual level. Now, we live in a culture that um, has been for a long time... Uh, fairly far removed from that blatant, uh, primitive kind of idolatry to the point that we would even reject the idea that we could be an idolatrous culture because we don't have those kinds of images and things. But it doesn't matter whether we have the image. If we're pursuing the ideology behind the image, then we're just as much an idolater as somebody who actually has the statue or the image or whatever the case might be. Now, these believers, again, they dwelt where Satan's throne was. And as we pointed out, this was a, a center of idolatry. You know, Satan's throne has spread far and wide these days, hasn't it? And there's hardly a place today where Satan's throne isn't. You know, that extreme kind of a situation that you found in Pergamos. Boy, more and more as time progresses, that kind of a thing is just developing all over the world today. It's astounding. Places that at one time had a strong Christian witness. And as a result of that, um, you know, had a, a, an impact for good in the culture. Many of those places have gone completely in the other direction. I think of countries like um, New Zealand, for example. At one time, a, a lot of a, a, a lot of evangelical Christianity and um, the effects of that went far and wide throughout the culture. And you would consider New Zealand in some sense, culturally at least, 
a, a Christian country in as much as not, of course, not everybody in the country is a Christian, but people are following biblical guidelines and, and trying to live, you know, according the laws are set up according to a biblical morality and things like that. Boy, New Zealand, you go there today and then their, their legislature and all, they are doing their best to, to remove themselves as far from that uh, reputation as they possibly can. And you find this in, in different places. You go up to Canada. You know, years and years ago, there was a lot of vibrant, thriving churches in Canada. You go over to Britain, of course. You can't go around the British Isles without realizing that at one time, Christianity, at least culturally, dominated this place. There's churches every hundred feet. And, you know, the streets are all named after biblical events or places and you know it's just it's obvious that there was such a uh, an impact of christianity in these countries and of course we could say the same thing to some extent about our own country here but you see today how far and and the great effort to just remove themselves as far from that sort of ideology as possible and we just see all around the world, we see that Satan's throne, it seems that it's being more established uh, more obviously in more places than it has ever been. You know, the West was traditionally Christian. And believe me, I'm using that term loosely. I'm not under any delusion that everybody was Christians. And even when it comes to the establishing of this nation, I think we sometimes we can get a bit delusional about where these guys were really at. Many of these guys were not Christians, but they were theists. They believed in God. They believed to a certain extent in the God of the Bible. They didn't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. They didn't believe in his atoning death necessarily. They weren't born again Christian people, but they believed in a God and they believed in a morality that was rooted in the scriptures. But, you know, that's the, the tradition of Western culture. But look what we have today. We have Islam dominating a large part of the world. We still have Hinduism and Buddhism, and we have even secular ideologies like communism. But now in the West, we have a radical humanism. So in each one of these particular religions or uh, philosophies or ideologies, what do you have? Basically, you have Satan's message. You have Satan's throne. Whether it's erected right there in the heart of Mecca, or if it's in Beijing, or if it's in um, you know, the heart of India with Hinduism, or if it's right smack dab in the middle of London, or Paris, or Washington, D.C., or you know, we're, we're living in a time when the powers of darkness are gaining tremendous uh, momentum. And because that's the case, we will find ourselves perhaps more and more in a situation like Antipas, in a situation where we might become perceived by the culture around us as against all, because like I said earlier, how can you be for so many of the things that are going on. But again, going back to the personal thing, because that's really the main issue here tonight. Where am I at personally? Is Jesus the Lord of my life? Meaning, is Jesus the one who's really the authority over my life? Am I worshiping him by the fact that I'm submitting to him? that I'm living the way he calls me to live, that I'm honoring him as God, I'm not trying to be God over my own life, or I'm not serving some other thing. And of course, in our culture, there's so many different things that people go in pursuit of. Fame and fortune and wealth and all of those kinds of things. People are serving so many different things. Probably the, 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 the God of... Western civilization today, I would say, is probably pleasure. 
I think if we had a, uh, a pantheon of, of gods that were the gods of Western civilization, I think right at the head of the whole thing would be the god of pleasure. Because in the end, that's what people are after. They're after pleasure. They're after self-gratification. And that's what people are living for today. And that's exactly what the scriptures told us would happen in the, the final days of history. That men would be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. But have we, who are God's people, have we let those kinds of things creep into our lives? Have we become idolatrous maybe? In our quest for pleasure. Are we living for Jesus or are we living for ourselves? Are we living from, for some sort of pleasure? Now, let's be honest. There are a lot of people in churches today who are living for a lot of other things than for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one of the sad and tragic things about the church today. Still a lot of churches in this country, still a lot of people in attendance in church. But if you got down to the individuals and, and really investigated where, where are you at with the Lord, you would find that many people who are in church, maybe even faithfully, are not really serving Christ. They're not really seeking him. I mean, after all, there are churches that are dedicated entirely to helping people become prosperous. The largest church in the country, 25,000 seats, I think. What's the main message that's coming out of that pulpit? The main message is, this is your best day. It's all about you. It's all about you being wealthy and prosperous and successful. And that's what God wants for your life. Where in the world do you find that in the pages of the New Testament? You don't. It's an invention. It's, it's bringing in false ideas. But again, the toleration level is just unbelievable today. We'll, we'll let anything in. Because in the church, we've also succumbed to the idea that we don't want to, you know, we don't want to speak out against that. We don't want to be seen as negative. We don't want to be seen as intolerant. But Jesus... He's intolerant. And he's never going to change. There are things that he just simply will not tolerate. You know, salvation is his gift to us and we take it on his terms, not on ours. If we try to take it on our terms, guess what? It's not available. We take it on his terms because he's God. He's the one who made us and he's the one who lays down the rules. He's the one who says this is the way it's going to be. Now, in this world we live in, you can manipulate, you can connive, you can do all kinds of things to try to get your way. You can find the loophole, you can go around the back door, but you can't do that with the Lord. He's the one person that that won't happen with ever. And as he looks at the idolatry, he has one word, and it's repent. There's only one thing to do, and it's repent. Repent. There's no negotiating. There's no compromise. There are no, well, why don't we just adjust this a little bit? There's one thing. Repent. Or else I will come to you quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So Jesus gives really just this is it. You, you repent or, of course, judgment is what he's referring to when he talks about coming and fighting with the sword of his mouth. So he says that he would come and bring judgment. And then, once again, bringing it to the individual, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, so God is speaking this. And he says, whoever, whoever can hear what I'm saying. He's wanting, he's wanting a response from us. But, of course, it begins with hearing, hearing what he's saying, but then he gives the promise to him who overcomes. I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Now, it's interesting, you know, here the Lord is speaking to the church, but he's taking them back. He gives them a reference to Balaam, takes them back to Israel's history. But then secondly, he refers to the manna. 
And interestingly, it was in the time of Balaam that uh, the children of Israel were wandering through the wilderness and they were being fed on manna. But Jesus says to them, to the one who overcomes, he says, I will give the hidden manna to eat. Now, what's he talking about here? Well, the manna was that heavenly bread that came down and sustained Israel in their uh, wandering through the wilderness. But Jesus, during his public ministry, you remember, he said, I am the true bread that came down from heaven. And I think what he's saying here to us is that to, to the overcomer, I will give you that sustenance. I will give you that spiritual nutrition. I will give you that life that you need. It will come as a, as a direct result of your connection with me. The hidden manna, that which satisfies. Why do people get sucked into idolatry anyway? Well, they get deceived into thinking that that idol somehow has something for me, that that is going to satisfy me in some way. That's a deception. Idols don't satisfy. Nothing can satisfy a human soul except God. Because God created the soul to be satisfied by only him. And all of these idols are nothing but attempts to find satisfaction, find fulfillment, find peace, joy, whatever, outside of him. It can't be done. Jesus says, I will give you the hidden manna. I will give you the true and the ultimate satisfaction. And he said, and I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written. Now, this is perplexed. Bible commentators, there's not a single commentator that I read that knows for sure what this reference is to here. But there's different possibilities. In the ancient world, they would use to determine whether a person was guilty or innocent in a, in a court setting, they would use white or black stones. If the person was innocent, they would cast a white stone. If they were guilty, they would cast a black stone. And so some have thought that Jesus was actually speaking of the fact that he would acquit them, that they would be declared innocent on the day of judgment. And that might be what he's referring to here. Um, others have thought that maybe it's just a white stone, incidentally, a white stone so that you could see the name that's inscribed on it. Some have thought that maybe because in certain athletic competitions, they would cast a uh, stone in favor of their, uh, or, or, you know, in regard to the person that they favored, uh, that it had something to do with that. So we don't know exactly what Jesus is saying, except he says that on the stone, there's going to be a new name written. And so, really, the ultimate promise here is that for those who overcome, I give you a new life. I give you what you can't naturally give yourself. In the context, remember, of persecution, in the context of suffering, in the context of Antipas. But Jesus says, I give you a new name written, which no one knows except the one who receives it. So the whole promise, even though we might not know the exact details, the whole promise is ultimately about intimacy with him and a whole new experience of life, which, of course, in this context would be referring to life everlasting. The overcomer, as we will find in each of these Churches, the overcomer ultimately is one who has everlasting life, one who will go on with the Lord, one who will live eternally with him in his glory and share in all of his majesty for all eternity. What a wonderful thing. That's the promise. You know, the battle is always between the flesh and the spirit and the battle is always between now and forever. The flesh says live for now. The spirit says live for eternity. The, the devil says, now's the time. The Lord says, eternity 
is where you need to set your heart because time is running out. And that's, that's what we have to choose between. The world is passing away and the lust of it. And remember what preceded that in that passage there. That loving the world and loving the Father are mutually exclusive. You can't do both things. You can do one or the other. But John tells us, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What's in the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, all of those things, they're contrary to God. And like I said, they never do for you what you think they're going to do anyway. God has, what God has for us is so much better. It's so much better because the Lord, you know, he blesses us and he satisfies us and he allows us to enjoy the good things of life. That's what he created them for. It's only when we try to do it our way, when we take those things that he meant to, he meant for us to have them in a certain context. But when we take them out of the context and say, no, I'm not going to do that in this context. I want to do it over here. That's when it becomes a problem. And that's when it becomes destructive. God's created all things richly for us to enjoy. But we have to enjoy them within the limitations that he sets because he knows if we take them outside of those boundaries, that's when they're no longer enjoyable. That's when they become destructive. So the whole picture is always God is looking out for me. He's looking out for you. He's looking out for us. He loves us. He has our best interests in mind. And all of this instruction is for our benefit. Don't get led off into idolatry because idols can never satisfy. They can only disappoint. And in the end, the person who hopes in an idol that can't see, can't hear, can't speak, can't walk, a person who hopes in them ends up just like them. They can't hear. They can't speak. They can't see. They can't talk. They can't walk. They can't function. But Jesus promises life. He promises life. And so that's the message to the church of Pergamos. Don't allow idolatry in. Keep it out. Don't be married to the system of the world. You're married to Christ. He's our great bridegroom. And we want to keep ourselves for him.